Welcome back, art lovers, to Midnight Viewing, the Night Gallery podcast, where we discuss Night Gallery, Rod Serling's follow-up to The Twilight Zone. I'm Father Malone, and with me here in the gallery are the podcast of powers, Mike White. It's like hell, man. <laughs> and of mushrooms and men's, Chris Stashew. Was it intentional that on the episode with Forrest Tucker you mentioned the mushroom podcast that I do? I think not. <clears throat> No. Now, this is season two, episode nine, which aired on November the 17th, 1971. The episode was split into four segments. Those are House with Ghost, A Midnight Visit to the Neighborhood Blood Bank, Dr. Stringfellow's Rejuvenator, and Hell's Bells. Painting number one, out of the real estate section of a ghost town weekly. A gingerbready item quite appropriately called House with Ghost. This, ladies and gentlemen, is... The Night Gallery. House with Ghost, written by Jean R. Kearney from a short story by August Derleth and directed by Jean Kearney as well. Starring Bob Crane, Joanne Worley, Bernard Fox, who I mainly know from a movie called Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, which I now realized having rewatched this episode, I saw way too much in my youth. It also, <laughs> it also stars Eric Christmas at the same year he appeared in Harold and Maude as the priest and Alan Napier. Very briefly, it was so weird seeing Alfred in anything other than Wayne Manor and rocking an Imperial. That's where the mustache and the Ooh, mutton chops yeah. meet in the middle. Oh, wonderful. This is the story of an expat couple living in London who need a change of scenery in a new home. They pick one with a ghost. Also, the husband is a duplicitous ass who is encouraging his wife to have a mishap through supernatural means. What do you think of this one, Chris? It's the first time I've ever seen Bob Crane in anything. Really? Yeah, which is kind of weird. <laughs> you never it, it, watched it, Hogan's Heroes? Not a singular episode, my friend. Wow. What'd you not think? a single wow. one. He plays a dickhead really well, but I don't think he was known for playing a dickhead in Hogan's Heroes. He kind of was, actually. Oh, really? Okay. So he plays the dickhead really well. Greg Kinnear played him in the biopic autofocus of him. Do you think that that's an appropriate casting? Because I think it's the greatest casting of all time. I think yeah. if I, I think if anyone's going to be cast as this guy, at least Greg Kinnear looks like him. And then I have never found Greg Kinnear to be a an actor who can be genuine. I feel like he's really good at playing people who are immensely <laughs> disingenuous, like in Mystery Men. So makes sense. I don't know. Bob Crane plays really disingenuous really well. Agreed. It was fun. It's kind of like the diary. The character at the end does kind of get their just desserts. Maybe not as much as they should, but yeah, it was it was fine. Yeah, this was kind of great seeing Hogan and Dr. Bombay and Alfred and Joanne Worley all in one episode. I didn't realize just how stacked Joanne Worley is. I I guess i'm just used to seeing her in like those moo's and terrible outfits that she used to wear on like laughing and uh, i think she did a couple stints on match game if memory serves but i love her and so i was a little i immediately sympathized with her that bob crane was trying to kill her it was a little obvious what was going on in this one but i had fun with it i thought it was kind of nice and then the twist at the end i thought they could have gone a little bit further with it but yeah, I thought it was all right. It kind of reminded me a little bit of that Portafoy episode from the, you know, the pilot. This whole thing of, you know, using supernatural means to get rid of somebody. Wasn't it filmed in the same house? <laughs> sure looked like it. Sure look, every, case, every, every time they do an episode in a building or a house with a staircase, like a grand staircase, I just, I'm con you couldn't convince me it's not that same set from the first episode of the show. We got a staircase in this one. Let's go over to stage 12. Right. <laughs> the werewolf noises, though, we're going to leave those out. <laughs> yeah. For this this time. Just this one. <laughs> I think this is, I like this one a lot. I thought it was a great idea. One I wish were actually true. Real estate being sold because the houses are haunted. And not just rent or buy a haunted house, but what level of haunting you're looking for. Like, right. Uh, and where the ghost is. Yeah. Like, oh, do you want, this is a basement ghost. You good with that? Like, yeah, that, that sounds good. Like just moaning, right? Nothing. It's not going to stab me. Oh no, 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 no. It just moans. Joanne Worley. I agree with you, Mike. I adore her and I've never seen her so restrained yeah. in performance. She's usually like beyond 10. She's up at 15 or 20, like with that voice. And she was great at it. I'm not criticizing her or anything, but like good to see a natural performance out of her here. You know, they kept talking. Okay, so the lead characters have swapped houses. They're from New Jersey. They've taken this flat in London, which 
they were in a house in New Jersey. Bob Crane's talking about it like it's the greatest thing on earth and like how terrible that where they are then. And I'm just like, are you guys kidding? You're in the middle of London. Like, we can't have good parties. We know what kind of parties you're looking for, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I did appreciate that. You know, it's a little, little tongue in cheek. Maybe not just a tongue, but so okay. So they get to the they get to the new house with Ghost, and immediately the Ghost starts to fuck with them by using a Ghost razor. My favorite part of the episode is this <laughs> this this razor that the Ghost is cutting their bag open with. Oh my right. god! Oh, just one example of Ghost items because later he gives him a bill, like a Ghost bill. <laughs> A ghost receipt. This is your charge. I don't know. That tickled me more than it should have. Oh, I did want to point out that his mistress, Bob Crane's mistress that he's philandering around with, was Trisha Noble. She was Padme's mom in the Star Wars prequels. Oh, wow. Good call on that. I never would have put those two together. Yeah. I mean, she looked great here. And then, like, thinking back, like, she just died maybe, you know, a few years ago. But but in the prequel, she looked great, too. So I don't know. I don't know what she was drinking, but it was working. Overall, I really did like the episode. I think her demise. Oh, my God. When she's being pulled down the hallway by the specter sort of early on, like, I thought it was genuinely frightening. They used this fisheye lens on it and stuff, and it felt unsettling. And I genuinely felt for her. Also, when she finally goes tumbling down the stairs to her demise... The fact that Bob Crane flattens himself against the wall <laughs> and just watches her tumble, like, again, just uh, that really what a yeah. sack of shit. Really, yeah. just what a horrible guy. And, like, uh, you know, he deserved worse than he got. However. That's what I'm saying, man. He really deserved worse. Yeah, Way he worse. didn't really get a proper comeuppance. So the ghost shows up and he's like, all right, listen, I did this for you. And now you're going to be paying my mistress because my mistress got shut out by my ex-wife so or my late wife or I'm the late. Anyway, so that's what's going to happen. And if you don't do that, I'm going to kill you. But it seems that ghosts are sort of bound by their physical limitation, like their previous residences, right? Like, isn't that the basis of the entire episode? So how does he propose to enforce that? Does he have ghost friends on the outside? I mean, the solution is just... Bob Crane would just be like, later. Yeah, like... Hey, uh, you know what? Suddenly, New Jersey sounds great to me. Thanks for the <laughs> th- thanks for the murder. Bye. <laughs> I'm going home, guys. Like, I don't know why you expected me to stick around here where my <laughs> wife was murdered by a ghost who can't leave the house. I know poltergeist rules. Apparently, we play by poltergeist rules here. Yep, uh, just head to the hotel. Put the TV outside. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, you know, but really enjoyable episode. And from Gene Kearney, who I have pretty much not enjoyed anything he's written so far. I think this one was worth Speaking of Lovecraft, last time, Darelith ends up being, like, the... One of the people who's originally publishing Lovecraft, right? Like, he kind of made his bones publishing Lovecraft stuff. Totally. And this is a, yeah. this is a worthy adaptation of the work, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this is... I think this is fun because of who they have in it. If it hadn't been Bob Crane, might not have been as fun. But he's enjoying himself the same way Larry Hagman was enjoying himself in the first <laughs> season of this show. Yeah. Bring back Larry Hagman. I want more of him. Right? There are a few actors who pop up a bunch. Uh, we're going to see William Wyndham again, and uh, Joanna Pettit shows up next season, and John Astin's There's even all an over act- this. Oh, There's an actor at the end of this uh, episode who's been on the show, what, two other times now? Well, His wife was one. just on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's And I... I don't know if they were married at this point. I don't think they were, actually. But uh, but yeah, John Astin is, was, appeared in the first season. He appears in this season. He appears next season as well. So yeah, give us more of Bob Crane and Larry Hagman, I guess, you know? But yeah, Bob Crane, he just like, oh, you just want to slap him. But at the same time, he's like, he's so charming. It's, I don't know, it's an off-putting combination. I've never looked into his murder, and that would be something maybe worth doing an episode of another show on, because it's never been solved, right? That's what autofocus is ostensibly about so yeah i wanted autofocus to be better i really wanted it to be better like i was more interested in the video equipment they were using than the actual movie so and i was like i think i should probably care more about the characters but i was just like oh is that an old tube video camera oh how did is that a deck are they doing yeah it did sort of fetishize that equipment because i felt the same way like oh man okay good Oh, yeah. No, no, 100%. But I think I keyed in a little bit more than you. But but yes, it, that's that, that's what that whole movie is about. Look at that equipment, man. Like, oh, yeah, yeah look at that screen he's putting in. Jesus Christ, what a setup. <laughs> 
and you kind of just want you know Willem Dafoe to come over to your house and like hey man let's have an orgy and it's like yeah great let's do it <laughs> it's a group girl buddy <laughs> yeah I just wanted to see those tapes too that was the other thing I was just like yeah just show me the Bob Crane tapes I don't care about the rest of this stuff I, I now are they out there has anyone seen them I don't know I haven't seen them uh, what is this like snuff film is that what you want to watch <laughs> <laughs> no 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 he they filmed all of their dalliances they had like origins oh, and, and craziness yeah right yeah, yeah. And that, oh nice it, it, awesome. it ties into the murder so before we get to our next segment this season i've been highlighting some talent behind the scenes in night gallery all of this <laughs> case it's in front of the camera it appears in our next segment it's simply named bats chirping very scooby-doo yeah, they didn't have to go far for this because it actually originated in the Universal Sound Effects Department. I, I'm not sure of the date of its creation, but I do know Bats Chirping has appeared in literally hundreds of different titles, not the least of which is every Halloween episode of every television series produced by Universal Television. And it actually, Bats Chirping kicks off our next segment, which is A Midnight Visit to the Neighborhood Blood Bank, written by Jack Laird, directed by William Hale, starring Victor Buono, so that's two Batman alumni in the same <laughs> Well, episode. we're having a little Beneath the Planet of the Apes reunion here as well with the next segment. Right. Chronologically speaking, this is Buono's first appearance on the show but if you had seen it any time other than its original airing you, this would be the second time you had seen him because the segment i forget the name of it replaced witch's brew satisfaction guaranteed. guaranteed there we go that replaced witch's brew on the last season so oh it also stars journey laird the other uh, the other actress and that is jack laird's daughter um it's it's a blackout sketch dracula shows up wants some blood but she gave it the office that's the whole thing it's just a matter of semantics really Mm -hmm. <laughs> why are the titles not swapped this would be a total waste of time if victor buonos weren't so goddamn charming man and oh I, yes i like he that saved he something like murder can hurt you from being not as good as it could have been because he commits in something like that i appreciate victor buono committing whenever he's doing anything oh he's amazing I like that little notebook he has, though, the little notebook of victims like, oh, I don't know. I got to cross another one. I can't feed on this one. He's dressing like it's the 1890s, but he's got a 20th century solution, you know? <laughs> right. And just all the makeup on his face. He's so different of a performance of Dracula than when we just saw Cesar Romero doing. Wouldn't you like to see a whole movie of Buono's Dracula? I sure would. Yes, I, like I actually see, would. Yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing a Buono versus Romero, you know, like you said, another take our Batman villains and cast them in a new characters, all both as Dracula. Yes. And then have George Hamilton being the referee between the two of them and just <laughs> calling them both derogatory slurs the entire time. Yeah. 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 Just a multiverse Dracula movie that <laughs> needs to happen with every version. <laughs> Can't we digitize them all into one thing? <laughs> Please, yes. Have you ever seen The Mad Butcher with Victor Buono? Oh, yes. Oh, so good. He's just, I don't know, man. What is it about that guy? Like, he's so good in everything. But, you know, my first introduction was King Tut, obviously, on the old Batman show. But, like, every time I see him in something, he's just so, he's better than everything on screen. Every oh, time he's even really good in something we talked about on Rankin and on Bass, the, the Flight of the Dragon cartoon, where he's in that with James Gregory, of all people. That's right. Yeah, he's good there. Even like, I don't know. Like, again, he obviously passed away <clears throat> way too soon. He was 43 when he oh. died, <sighs> which is just like such a shame. Just such a shame because you really like if he had lived into the 80s there would have been a whole opportunity for him to have a career resurgence like i genuinely believe that oh yeah he was portrayed as a character in that m most recent television series feud oh really yeah about betty davis versus uh, joan crawford yeah he's, he's mm -hmm. a character in that the actor they got playing him was remarkably good like wow a, a decent performance and uh, they seem to have captured his essence so if you're a bono fan check that one out interesting nice as our third selection an item from the past, that uniquely American institution known as the Pitchman, the wheeler and dealer of magical nostrums, guaranteed to cure, to palliate, to bring back the glow of health to everything but a cadaver, bottled dreams, if you will. Our painting is called Dr. Stringfellow's Rejuvenator. Drink hearty. 
Our next segment is Dr. Stringfell's Rejuvenator, written by Rod Serling, directed by Gerald Friedman. This one's special because this is the painting we use to represent Mike in all of our animated ads. But on, into the episode <laughs> itself, it stars Forrest Tucker, Murray Hamilton, Don Pedro Colley, and Lou Frizzell. It's the story of an Old West medicine show snake oil salesman whose rejuvenation tonic can cure any ailment, including death. Maybe. I think that's what happens. What'd you think of this one, Mike? Oh, okay. I'm glad I'm not the only one who's a little confused by this one. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy to see Don Pedro Colley. I love that, that guy. So just anytime he shows up in anything, I was so happy. Murray Hamilton, same thing. I mean, always great to see him. And then Forrest Tucker, I thought he did a great job as well. But yeah, I just didn't get the motivation of these characters and exactly what was happening. I mean, it almost feels like Murray Hamilton knows Forrest Tucker from the past, but they don't really make it that clear. And then poor Don Pedro Cali, like he he's not a magic Negro in this, thank goodness, but he's definitely he's dumb, but he's wise at the same time. So yeah, I was just I was a little confused as far as what was actually going on with this one. And I mean, I don't think that that stuff cured anything. So yeah, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this. Chris, hear me out here. <laughs> I get where they were going and it took them a long time to get there. But ultimately, what was the fucking point? <laughs> <laughs> so where also, did they go? Where did... I don't know. I think they thought that they were making some sort of interesting statement on like responsibility as someone who is full of shit selling snake oil and whether or not that haunts you as a person. And I think that's what the Murray Hamilton character is trying to get at. But uh. um, I don't get it. Like, I don't get the point of this story, really. Like, I was confused by the narrative that they were telling. It really was. I liked it. I thought the direction was really strong. I thought the acting across the board was great. I think it looked really good, like a little movie. You know, <clears throat> virtually every Western, or like B-Western anyway, was made on a back lot. So here the back lot is actually a benefit instead of a distraction. As far as the story goes, now, I think a medicine show character is bursting with supernatural potential. In that way, I was really drawn to the episode. I was looking forward to what they were going to do with it as far as that goes. Rod chose not to do anything really in that regard. It's just, you know, another... Again, I don't know what he's trying to say other than a biter gets bit kind of thing, maybe. Like this right. th this man who sells hope, like, you know, ends up being hopeless. Maybe. What's funny is now our lead here is the antagonist, right? Because he's duping this man who has a sick child and telling him this rejuvenation tonic is going to cure her. I don't have any problem with portraying the death of a child on screen. I think the moment in Assault on Precinct 13 where they shoot the little girl with the ice cream cone is an actual thing of beauty. And anything is on the table as far as storytelling goes. But the story of a villain profiting on a hopeless situation, particularly with a dying child, makes me queasy in ways that are hard to articulate. The episode putting me on that kind of an edge, I actually appreciate it. I know it just sounds contrary to what I just said, but I thought that was a win that that it, I actually felt invested in that father and his child. But to me, oh, yeah. the antagonist of this piece is absolutely not Dr. Stringfellow. It's Murray Hamilton's character who they kind of pass off as the town drunk, right? He's a town drunk and he used to be a surgeon. And he's supposed to be this kind of personified guilt for Stringfellow, like, you know, a drunken Old West Jiminy Cricket, which is fine and interesting, except he's able to call him out because he's been witnessing what's going on. And this surgeon does not go up to that father and say, hey, your daughter's going to die and this is nonsense and he's selling you false hope. No, he waits he waits till they're gone so he can pounce on, on Forrest Tucker, man. If he really wanted to, like, call him out, he could have done it while the fucking pitch was going on. Like, he could have Sweeney Todd the whole thing, you know? Like, this is a bullshit you're selling, and all of these people are going to die who's going to take it. Like, I, I don't know. Oh, I'm complaining a lot about that, but I got to say, I did enjoy the episode sort of overall weirdly even though the ending is so obtuse i can't even really figure it out like i read the script you you gave me mike and it's actually a little more explicit in the script in that when he sees the ghost of the girl 
His reaction is, I'm hoping you're real. I'm hoping I did revive you because we're going to make so much money with my tonic. <laughs> And then the wow. sign, and then the sign falls on him and kills him, and that made sense. What we get here is, it was a ghost, I guess, but she makes the sign fall on him. Like I don't know. I don't Who know. knows, right? Who knows? It's not supernatural, but it is. The fact right. that Rod Serling can't pick is really frustrating, because there's nothing wrong with it being supernatural. Actually, that that may be one of the reasons we're here. <laughs> For fuck's sake, like, don't feel like you have to hew close to reality constantly and every there can without without with supernatural stakes, there can be no real comeuppance is kind of what this feels like. Sometimes it's like supernatural comeuppances somehow are less are less than a real comeuppance. Like, oh, someone being turned into a fly and being stuck in a web is less of a comeuppance than a sign cracking this dude over the back of his head and causing him to just die from a broken neck maybe or i again not clear very obtuse so and that's the thing like rod you made your bones on the show about the supernatural interceding in people's lives and teaching them a lesson why are you pretending like it's not something you want to be involved with now right right yeah where's that monkey paw edge to this even the diary like it was pretty explicit at the end that was a punch this is a weak slap like it, Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to kick him again, but, you know, he's not a horror guy, ultimately. Like, as much as he forced himself to be a science fiction guy for Twilight Zone, like, horror just doesn't mesh with Rod unless it's just bitterly ironic enough to qualify. But, like, once he gets into ghosts and stuff, he just seems out of his depth, and that's evident here. And what's great is Forrest Tucker is so immensely unlikable that you really want to see him get his comeuppance in a really satisfying way. Yeah. And I don't I have not seen Forrest Tucker in a lot of things. He's an original Ghostbuster, guys. That's a thing. It's a real horrifying Ghostbuster. Oh yeah, the, the, with the a live gorilla. action show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's like he's the yokel on that show, I believe. He just seems so immensely unlikable, just like as a person. I feel like, like to his core being like, I, not I, maybe Boris Tucker, the actor wasn't that way, but it just seems like he has such an air about him that it is just natural that this character feels so nasty. And it just, I wanted the comeuppance to fit the crime of taking advantage of a father and daughter who are like wasting away in front of him. Like you need to pay the piper pal. And not just, Oh, maybe it was supernatural. Like take a stand, Rod. Come on, man. Well, you it's your show still. still has your name on it. <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen F Troop, but I want to say he was kind of the, almost the Andy Griffith to Larry Storch's Barney Fife in that one, but I could be proven wrong very easily. It's funny because when I was growing up, F Troop and Hogan's Heroes were like staples on TV. So getting this revisitation of these two actors is kind of interesting. Oh, I was having F Troop flashbacks all through this. Like, I right? loved him on that show. I loved him here. He was so mean. But, like, yeah, he ain't that way in the on F Troop, Chris. Like, he's he's fun. Interesting. And, and, and nice. Yeah. Like, like Salt this, of the Earth. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Huh. He portrays the, he portrays such a bastard so well. I kind of, you could convince me he was just this way. And I'd be like, yeah, right. You also, know, I love Murray Hamilton just playing characters with no backbones. Like, that's oh, just yeah. his. Yeah. All right. You spineless turd. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he was on the Twilight Zone. He was in an episode that Rod Serling wrote, of course, called One for the Angels, where he played Death. And uh, Death was pretty spineless there, too. Like, m go, you go, Mary Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, he's so great. I yeah. love him. Oh, you know what I wanted to say? Like, this got me reading about traveling medicine shows. And mm. so, you know, they sprang up in Europe, you know, in the, like the 17th century. And there it was all about the pitch. So they started doing like a little performance beforehand, you know, jugglers or sharpshooting or whatever, just to draw people in. When it came to America and it came with the original colonists, like they sprung up almost immediately. Slowly over time, it became, the pitch was sort of thrown in at the beginning and it became about the show, which is such an American thing. It just made me happy to read that. And they actually lasted until the 1940s. They were put out of business by the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Trade Commission. You know? oh, nice. Yeah. The real question is, were those jugglers crusty? <laughs> I don't get that. 
it's from hot it fuzz. is a hot fuzz yeah <laughs> crusty I jugglers no one like we don't say the word juggler enough <laughs> right like when are we going to use the word juggling jugglers in a in everyday in everyday parlance so well trust me you do not want to watch the movie night of the juggler thinking that you're gonna get that so <laughs> where was the juggling i know i can think of two things wrong with that title <laughs> <laughs> When I was a projectionist and we showed the director's cut of Brazil had just come out and we had literally dozens of people like every week and go, what? I, I, I thought it was about Brazil. What? Like, like, <laughs> when Bra- do they get to Brazil? Yes. Right. Yeah, like what? Like Brazilians coming out. Like, wh- I thought this was going to be my homeland. Our final selection this evening, an import from that other region, that infernal inferno down below, offered to you now in living color. And with a small scent of sulfur. Our painting is called Hell's Bells. Our final segment is entitled Hell's Bells, written by Theodore J. Flicker, based on a short story by Harry Turner, and directed by Theodore J. Flicker, starring John Aston and special appearances as the group of demons Gene Kearney, Jack Laird, and then Theodore J. Flicker as the devil himself. This is a story of hippies in hellfire when Randy Miller finds himself in a new version of Eternal Damnation. What'd you think, Chris? Hey, you've got the two hosts of the Barney Miller Show talking about Teddy J. Flicker. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I don't know any, I mean, the only other person who might be able to speak to Theodore J. Flicker better than the two of us might be our good friend Otto Bruno. You know, it's a blackout sketch, right? Yeah, just just extended. Just extended. It's like three panels as opposed to one. John Aston playing a hippie will never not be funny because he <laughs> is not believable <laughs> as a hippie, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen him trying to be so hip, man, but... <laughs> it was pretty I, funny. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. <laughs> this is way funnier than it has any right to be, but it, I think it's just the right length to be. Oh, it's fun. It's fun, and that's all it needs to be. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I mean, that he has to come to the realization and have the devil tell him well there's a house just like this in the other place too and just like really spell it out to him as far as what one man's heaven is another man's hell okay thanks but i was just so happy to see hank warden in here as the very boring man i'm hoping everybody would know him as the waiter from twin peaks the i know about you just the that just old blew man. My mind. Father Malone just had his mind blown. <laughs> yeah, man, I knew I knew him from somewhere. That's yeah, that's the he's the uh, the giant's counterpart from the the Black Lodge. Yeah, it's so great. This the overriding in this that kind of like two on the nose bit about in heaven there's a room just like this one. Right. That was I thought for a moment that the. The phantasmagorical apparition of Rod Serling had invaded my screen because that's a Rod Serling ism if I've ever heard one. Holy shit. Oh, like, yeah. come on, Rod. We get it, Rod. We get it. Yeah. But this is not Rod's problem. That he didn't do this. This is this No, is, he sure didn't. He didn't. You know, it what's weird is this is the exact story from Pamela's voice starring John Aston last season where he, we figure out that she's in heaven and he's in hell in the same room. So, oh, wow. You know, so, but they didn't really sort of hammer on that in that episode. It was just about him being stuck with her forever. That was kind of the thrust of it. But underlying was this concept. And now here it is sort of laid out a little too bare, but it's entirely worth it for those boots, man. Those patchwork patent leather boots he's wearing. <laughs> Holy shit, those are beautiful. I love him as a hippie. I think he's hilarious. He seems like I think most hippies would be just people just dress in the part for looking for free love and shit. You know, he speaks the lingo, but he didn't believe any of it. And Uh, we all know by the end of the 80s, they're going to be so disillusioned, they want to reboot the Twilight Zone and make it all about how disillusioned they are. Exactly. Right, right. For the opening salvo, this is the guy. Did you guys read the short story this is based on? Exact same thing. Exact same thing. Except it's not obviously not a hippie. It's it takes place in England. These are English characters. The one major difference is that Randy Miller is the name of our character here in the short story. It's Septimus Throgmorton Duff. <laughs> <laughs> Throgmorton. 
best wow. name hyphen it <laughs> the rock morton <laughs> oh oh wait of course that's even better they so should have kept that they absolutely should have kept it there's no there's no cleaning lady who she just sort of keeps you know showing up and like and delivering exposition i love the the montage of what john Aston is imagining hell will be like and you know I, I don't know something about that montage like made me happy also his his line reading i saw this episode right around the same time i saw the previous one which was about 10 or 11 years old and i his man you're boring john Aston yeah. saying that to that guy in that tone like has reverberated in my head for 40 some odd years i don't know I, it's brief enough you know if it wasn't john Aston, i don't know that they could have justified the length of this one it you, like you said chris it's a three panel but it could have been a one you know oh for sure and and, and anybody else it would have been yeah but he's just so funny he's look he's so charming John Aston really is. It's it's almost like he was a lead in another show that he's so well known for that everybody else is just doing him anytime they do that character. Like, and then that John Aston is one of the more charismatic actors I can gen genuinely think of. That's still around too. He's ninety two. Yeah, still going out to the One World Cafe down in Baltimore. Walks there every day apparently. Wow. Yeah. You know, my great regret in life was that I was living in Santa Monica in the early 90s and was unaware that he was teaching yoga, that you could just, oh, go, wow. you could just go to his house and learn yoga from John Asta. Whoa, uh, that sounds amazing. Deep regret. <laughs> That's wild. Anything else on this one? It's pretty brave. I mean, you know, love John Aston. We can't wait to see him again. Yeah. 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 I always look forward to it. Yeah, John, John Aston makes a impression anytime he's in anything to the point where I always forget that he's at the beginning of National Lampoon's European Vacation. Oh, yeah. But every time I watch that movie, I am always so happy to see him as, uh, I guess, playing, you know, Richard Dawson, essentially. Do you watch that movie often? I, I know, once a year. Wow. Okay. Kind of like that movie. I don't know. That was the first one I ever saw of the vacation movies. Same here. I saw it at a drive-in, and but I never went back. Interesting. I get it. I've seen it a bunch. Not not every year, but. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you like what you like. You know what they say. I mean, hey, that's I'm why not... they make chocolate and vanilla. Yeah. You know, I, there's a there's like a there's, there's some always good one music in that people. movie too. Robert yeah. Plant and no, uh, in you know. European Vacation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's some really good music in that, actually. Yeah. And, you know, Holiday Road. I mean, come on. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> what better? Saint plan pour moi. That is a great song. Uh, yeah. Uh, God. First, first appearance of that song in an American production. All right. We're going to play a preview of the next episode, and we'll be right back to wrap things up. This picturesque background is rural America. Its central figure, a young school teacher. But... This is where the commonplace ends. You're about to join a roster of students in a learning experience quite without precedent. The painting is called Dark Boy, and this particular repository is called The Night Gallery. I presume that most of you, in moments of weakness or in spasms of compassion, have picked up a hitchhiker. The story behind this item here has to do with a man who stops his car and invites a stranger in, and such a stranger. The kind that makes you wish you'd taken the bus or stayed in bed. It's titled, Keep in Touch. We'll think of something. That's right. On the next Midnight Viewing, we'll be taking a look at Season 2, Episode 10. That's broken into only two segments. The Dark Boy and Keep in Touch. We'll think of something. Until next time, where can people find you, Mike White? You can find me over at projectionboothpodcast.com. That's where I've got my links to all the socials and to all the places where you can listen to the podcast, or you can just go over to weirdingwaymedia.com and listen to it there. And you, Chris Dashu, same question. Weirdingwaymedia.com is where you can find this show and so many other shows worth checking out, including, like Mike said, Projection Booth, Astounding Tales of the Public Domain, which is your show, Father Malone, and then the Culture Cast, and all the things we worked on together and separately throughout the years and into the future. He did it for me. All right. Thank you all for joining us here at Midnight Viewing. The gallery is now closed. <laughs> <laughs>